Hi, Mike. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you, Amber. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thanks for joining us for this conversation. So we'll just jump right in. And um, I'm interested in the things you do with time in your film. You know, they sort of like a parallel time that the film pivots on. So maybe you could talk to us about that. Yeah, um, well, the film is set over two different time periods. One is like 19th, early 18th century, like uh, Edo State, and the other is sort of modern day uh, Lagos. Um, and I found that when I was writing a short film called The Man Who Cuts Tattoos, um, I was also working on another project um, called Born. And uh, I noticed sort of like parallels in the two on the two projects that I was working on. Uh, the man who cuts tattoos dealt with like scarification, um, rites of passage scarification uh, for those who want to attain uh, adulthood and marriage, and this sort of deals with this sort of physical pain on the body. So you can now so like a sacrifice essentially. So you can now attain a certain level in life and get married. Uh, both for men and women and the other script i was working on was based on a short film i'd made called born and that dealt with sort of like the emotional pain in, in a in a couple so when i realized that oh you know these two projects deal with pain you know one just happens to be emotional pain um the other happens to be sort of this uh physical pain and i realized that hey you know maybe this there's something something here and as i was sort of drafted as i started to combine the two films and started to draft draft the screenplay um i found that you know despite the fact that one set um 100 or so years in the past and one set in modern day the parallels and um people don't really kind of change all that much um but yeah, I was just, it was just, it just came from me linking these two projects uh, together that I was working on and, and, uh, yeah, and here we are with, you know, the feature film. Uh, this is, this is one of those moments when um, a person who's asking questions is like, wow, I mean, were you planning on answering my next question in advance? Because I've watched uh, two of your shots, uh, Rude and Bob. Yeah. And this film feels like an extension yeah. of, of those films. So just maybe you could talk about this idea of extending these shots via a feature film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, Brood, both Brood and Born, two short films that I made prior to making The Man Who Cuts Tattoos. I made Born in around 2016. And that was actually the other script that I, I was looking to adapt into a feature that then became um, the second story in The Man Who Cuts Tattoos uh, about a, um, a young couple who are having difficulty in a relationship and they both have to sort of sacrifice for one another in order for them to now find themselves uh, and, you know, coming back together in a relationship. Um, but no, uh, Bone is actually the short version of The Man Who Cuts Tattoos. So definitely it is an extension of um, of, of, of my feature. Uh, I, I, in terms of brood, I guess you could say it's an extension in the sense that it deals with, with a couple who have just been separated. Um, obviously because it's a short film, we don't get the sort of them coming back together at the end again. Um, but no, I, I always use my short films as, as a way to try and, um, work things out and, um, I often, oftentimes, especially in the case of Bourne, they are actually bigger projects, but I just don't have the resources to um, to to do that bigger project. Uh, so I, I I will do a short version and then see if at a later date it's something I can expand expand upon. And luckily with with Born, I I felt that. That was definitely something that I could do. Um, I actually have other shorts that I'm, you know, fingers crossed, hoping to one day uh, use uh, as sort of like a, a stepping stone to do something bigger with. Uh, I, I like this idea of uh, shorts as a 
testing ground for like ideas which you want to to build on in in a feature film or something because as you're saying there is a question of resources time etc etc so yeah i think that yeah. that would be interesting for other filmmakers who are watching this and they're like oh we want to make a, a feature film but do we just go right in you know, or how do we test some of the ideas we have yeah um so back to the film is uh, is it everything back to the film but um that your film is almost is very realistic like the 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 bits set in modern times are super realistic i can't i can't speak to how realistic like uh the scarification rituals and so on uh because you know there is like a cultural divide between me and edo people for instance but um i'm interested in in the ways in which and i feel in some way that because it's so realistic it elevated the the everyday into something you know very filmic something worth your time it didn't feel like oh, I, I know what's going to happen so i'm not going to spend time watching this it was quite interesting in that regard so could you maybe talk about how how you went about doing that like elevating that the ordinary into something you know film worthy so to speak because we we all know about breakups and so on but this was worthwhile worth our time so speak a little bit about that yeah um yeah i you know first and foremost i like telling stories about sort of just you know your ordinary person just the, you know ordinary folk um going about their sort of everyday at times sort of mundane business um, but, uh, I, I feel like, uh, when I set out to make this film, I, I wanted to utilize, uh, the transcendental style of cinema. Um, and that, that's like a style that, that was sort of popularized by, uh, like Ozu and Bresson, who are like two of my major influences when it comes to this particular film. Um, and uh, especially sort of Bresson, I, I, I ended up using a lot of kind of the same sort of limitations that they type of kind of use. I know Bresson uses only one, the one lens. Uh, so I, I use mostly just the one lens in this film. And I'll, you know, I also utilize other limitations, whereas where I, I kind of just like to use the one static shot um, as opposed to sort of, you know, overly cut in, you know, the traditional sort of classical Hollywood style of um, of editing a film that, you know, you're generally taught in, in, in film school. Um, so I guess the, the, that kind of realism that I was going for was probably, you could say, turned into like a more or elevated into more cinematic style by just using that kind of me transcendental methodology that I, that I, that I used as my um, approach for this, for, for this particular film. Um, uh, beyond that, I, I guess it's getting a certain type of performance as well. I, I, I really do like silences, the type that you generally get between people in real life. Um, you know, if you see like people conversating, it's not always just back and forth. There are, there are moments when people just don't say a lot or may just fall silent or, you know, think about something. So, you know, those silences are something I often work with, with my actors and, you know, because they're sort of used to just going in and having to say something, you know, um, it's sometimes it's difficult for me as a director to just be like, you know what, just take more time. And, it's like, oh, what do we do in this time? You know, it's like, well, we don't do anything, right? Um, so yeah, you just don't do anything. You just keep quiet and actually, you know, what you think, I want you to think, right? Um, so sometimes it's a bit difficult when you, you're dealing with actors who aren't sort of used to taking long pauses and taking long silences. But I think it adds to the realism. I do really think it adds to the realism of moments between people. Um, yeah, sure. Some will say, oh, well, you know, it could be a bit boring or it could be this or it could be that, or let's hurry it along, pace it for pacing reasons. Um, but I guess that's part of the transcendental style. You know, uh, Strada said that um, your typical film will lean out to the audience and do a lot of work for you, whereas a transcendental film will force you, the audience, to do a bit of work yourself and force you to sort of lean in, lean into the screen. So. Um, I'm trying to sort of balance those two, you know, the leaning in and leaning out uh, in, in this film, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, 
I hope that answers a bit of the question at least. Yeah. It does, it does. And I always enjoy uh, moments like this when it feels like we're not just talking about the film, we're also talking about filmmaking and film traditions and so on. So yeah, that was a, sure. a great answer. Yeah. More more yeah. of this content. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> So um, another thing I, I, I thought about as I watched the film was that this felt like a commentary on the on the place of women in Nigerian society. There's a scene where um, Michelle is asked if she's pregnant. I, I hope I'm not spoiling it for anyone, but um, the, the conversation that happens there, that moment is very it's very layered like as i was watching it i was like is nigeria like this and i know this is something you say that you're not interested in in like packaging nigeria for an international audience or something but do you think of your film as a commentary on the place and life of women in, in nigerian society uh, <laughs> okay it's a difficult question uh it one woman <laughs> one specific character I, you know, Nigeria is not a sort of homogenous place. Um, there are a lot of culture, different cultures, different tribes, different languages, um, religions. Um, you know, Lagos is different from Edo State, which is different from uh, Kanu or Bono, you know. Um, so yeah, um, what's true for women in one part is not true for women in another part. And obviously you have class divide as well. You know, the rich tend to get away with a lot more than say if you're poor, right? Um, and I guess that's true, you know, that's a universal truth perhaps, you know? Um, so no, um, this is definitely specifically about one woman. I, 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 the story originally came from a newspaper article about, um, a woman who was impregnated uh, by a pastor and the pastor fearing sort of his congregation finding out uh, gives her or at least attempts to give her some concoction to drink in an attempt to sort of terminate the pregnancy. So that's where the initial idea came from. It's like a newspaper story. Uh, so I just thought like, oh, wow, like what a moment, you know, um, powerful, you know, that's something that I would like to see, you know, see on screen because because of the drama aspect, I just feel like it's this sort of dilemma and this, um, you know, at the same time, she's, you know, she's got job issues um, because it is true that women are definitely pressured, you know, if they become pregnant in certain corporations, certain companies, they, they, were, they you know, they're, their their jobs will, will will be terminated if the boss finds out they uh, that they're pregnant. So there isn't that same um, I guess um, you know the laws aren't. Although I'm sure there's laws protecting women here, but they aren't. They, they wouldn't be enforced at all. You know, it's a very sort of patriarchal society, um, and yeah, in terms of like pregnancy there. It, it's it's your i'm not saying all corporations are like that but there are a lot of corporations that oh you're pregnant well go home to your husband it's time for him to now you know take care of you um so yeah 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 it's very true i i i know this from ex experience I've, I've even you know seen these things happen um so yeah uh but that's not true of everyone in every company and every place here but you know it, it it definitely does happen and um yeah i mean the scarification aspect is both men and women so they both actually have to sacrifice in that aspect for, for them to now be married so they have to go through that sort of painful ritual and i guess the film was um uh the other side of the film the emotional side you know this girl she does the termination it doesn't quite work she goes through all she's got these sort of you know she goes through a lot of trauma has these mental scars as well as emotional ones and um in order for you know she's done with this guy so in order for him to now sort of work his way back into her life um he too has to go through a similar process because she uses what she's learned you know, growing up about this sort of scarification process and sacrifice you have to take for one another 
in order to come from a union. She uses that as the basis for a way for him to sort of find his way back to her. Yeah, um, I actually, this is an aside, but one of the things that happened, what happens in the film is that there's a, a blackout or something like that, and and they say Nepal, Nepal, just 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 that one word and i thought to myself this feels like when we read nigerian fiction and they say in the past second lights again and in my head i was like this feels like watching a nigerian novel if that makes sense because it was that was a very nigerian moment so to speak um yeah it's everyday life yeah um, that's why i worked it. that's one of the reasons i always work those sort of things into mm -hmm. my film where I try to just the ordinary things mm. that actually happen mm. every day. For sure. Um, so you spoke earlier about how, you know, there are lots of languages in Nigeria, lots of um, ethnic groups, people of different classes, ETC. Mm. And I'm interested in yeah, your use of language as like a device in filmmaking, you know, um, that these people spoke a lot of Pidgin English, a lot of, you know, like other lo local languages and so on. And that what, what's your take? Yeah. What's the place of language in in the work you do as a filmmaker? Um, yeah, like I think language is so important. Like um, when I started making uh, short films in Nigeria, um, I well the first one I made was a tiny short film, my own little camera, I'm just grabbing some actors, and it was just, it was in English, and I just felt like. Everything in tele TV, Nollywood is on e is in English. Most of the cinema stuffs in English, and I just thought, why don't they use pigeon? You know, pigeon's like really. It's never it's never one of those things where you know pigeon is seen as like a second class sort of language, and English is seen as a first class language. You know, pigeon is often seen as like you know the stuff that you, you do with your friends in a beer parlor. Um, as opposed to something you do in a, maybe in a corporate setting or professional setting. And I always found that kind of odd because, you know, when I hear pigeon between people and when they're talking pigeon, it's, I find it like really poetic. I find like it gives, you know, especially in film, it gives you a sense of place. Um, and I just feel like it's just a bit more natural for people, for the actors to, and I've actually heard actors say, oh, thank God, this is actually in Pigeon. You know, I prefer doing roles in Pigeon. Um, and yeah, like, you know, part of, I also feel like there's this sort of renaissance now in African art and, um, and I feel like it's, I feel it's like, it's like the right thing to do, you know. Um, also, I, I feel like it's about sort of promoting uh, culture here. Um, oh, I, people speak English here. Don't get me wrong. So that does that, that is the reality here as well. But people also speak a lot of pidgin. But I find that I was told anyway for commercial reasons, make your films in English. You know, so it's easier to sell abroad and all that type of stuff. But I'm, I don't know. I I, I just prefer I prefer hearing pidgin. I prefer hearing more local languages and, and, and languages here. Uh, people from Edo who actually. You know, saw the trailer from the film. They're like, "Oh my God! Oh yeah, someone talking in our language." You know, so you know, they, people want to see that also. Um, and the, you know, yeah. So that's part of my motivation. But my main motivation is, I just find it really poetic. I like the, the back and forth, and I just like I like the sound of it, and I I, I feel it works for the type of movies that I make. I like that. Um, I am a huge fan of, of local languages, and there's always that question yeah. I feel in in countries where that are not regarded as the center, so to speak, of international filmmaking. There's a pressure to perform uh, to a certain audience, you know. So it's always refreshing mm -hmm. to hear someone say, "Yeah, I want to make um, content in these local languages." Um, so you're part of our collective, the Real Sixteen Collective, and um, I've read interviews where. All of you have essentially said you you 
you're trying to have like a departure from typical Nollywood fare. Uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting this. Maybe you're like, it was that ju just that one interview, or maybe this is this is something that's you know part of your ethos. So um, maybe talk to us about your approach to filmmaking, especially because you're making films in Africa's largest um, film industry. So uh, I'm interested in where you situate yeah. yourself within the context of, you know, Nigerian filmmaking or filmmaking in West Africa, but also maybe talk a little bit about this idea of, of a renaissance in, in African art and in African filmmaking and so on. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The Zero 16 is a filmmaking collective that I'm part of um, with two other filmmakers uh, Abba Makama and CJ Obasi. Um, uh, we formed in 2016. Um, I met CJ in like 2014 in Tanapa at the Afri Film, Af African International Film Festival. We both had films there, and he had a film there called Ojuju, which I really liked. It was like the zombie film in Pigeon, and it was really kind of low budget and gritty, and I, you know, but it was like one of the first times I'd seen just you know ordinary Nigerians interacting in a way that I that I, I had seen and understood um, felt very real, you know, natural to me. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we we formed a collective. Um, I guess because we felt like um, we were almost, you know, out, yeah, kind of like outsiders in a system that was doing a, um, is known for a particular type of filmmaking and in a in a style that's, uh, I guess, become kind of famous. Um, and we were looking to do something that maybe a little different, um, something more artistic, maybe arty or, you know, different genres, not your typical sort of melodrama or wedding film that was really prevalent, especially during those times. Um, and oh, no doubt, Nollywood's moved on a bit from 2014, 2015, 2016. There is sort of new stuff coming out now that I don't think was the same back there. So in fairness, uh, it has sort of grown a bit more now. Um, but uh, yeah, so it felt like we're outsiders. And so, you know, we had a WhatsApp group and we were talking often about like doing different things and more artsy things and different genres and we had ideas. And so we just formed a collective and we, we actually set like 16 16 guidelines, 16 roles in the same vein as like a dogma in 95 um, uh, uh, did uh, during the 90s. So, and you know, some of the roles were like, oh, um, you know, we encourage the use of uh, local languages, um, we encourage more genre films, um, and there's some tongue in cheek ones like. Uh, um, no, don't shoot, don't, don't take shots of the Lekki Koyi link bridge because it had become like this thing that would appear in almost like every Nollywood film because it's like a really cool bridge lit up at night and it's like this it just became like this synonymous um, establishing shot. Um, so yeah, it was a bit tongue in cheek and it was a bit serious as well. Uh, but, you know, essentially it was just for us to you know, come together, help each other out. It's better to come as a group than as individuals and just push a new, you know, kind of cinema um, that Nigeria may not quite be known for. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's I, I forget the other part of your question. It was about the renaissance in, in African art that you were speaking about, yeah. Okay, yeah, like I feel, I feel like, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know when all these things started. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a sort of an art critic, but I, I feel like, you know, maybe it's more of a music thing. You know, I think like the music on the continent is really sort of started to grow um, as it's improved. Like technically, um, I feel it's got to a place now where, you know, um, there, you know, the music is now like international. Um, it's the sound like people really want to sort of vibe to. Um, people are trying to sort of, people are now inspired by. Um, I think like there was a, a South African song in, in Black Panther recently. 
um, I think Nigerian stars, you know, the Burner Boys and the WizKids and the Davidos, I think they're like really international now. So I, I feel like, whereas growing up being, you know, I grew up in the UK. So I feel like, you know, growing up where sort of being African was not cool or not seen as cool for whatever reason. Um, uh, and I remember like discussing this, like growing up with my friends and being like, you know, what, you know, we really would have a lot of these sort of deep conversations about like why it was that people would, you know, hide, try and hide their Africanisms or, you know, what made them, who, you know, who, who, who they were, uh, especially like in school, I find that a lot of kids would do it. They would sort of, they would um, anglicize their names and, you know that that kind that kind of thing. You know they're trying to hide their identity, um, but now I feel like, and I feel maybe it's because of music. I'm not sure. I, I haven't really studied this thing, but I, I feel like that's changed whilst I've been in Nigeria. Because I came before like the music really blew blew up. But whilst I've been in Nigeria, I've heard that like the music's like popping off in places, and people now want to really show that they're African and Nigerian or from whatever part and I feel like it's cool now to be like, oh yeah, I'm from this part of the world, or um, I, yeah, I am African. You know, it's not something people hide as much anymore. Uh, I may be wrong, but that's just how I how I feel. So I feel like you know, art now coming from this part of the world as well. Um, you know, people want to see it. You know, they want to know our stories. They want to know what we're doing. They want to know what we're about. And I think it sort of ties into the whole language thing as well. You know. You, you know, really put it forward and push it in, 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 in sort of our cultural practices, you know, if you can put that into sort of film and um, push it out into the world, I, I do feel like there's a place for, for it now and people to be like, okay, yeah, let me see it. And when I say people, I mean like other um, Nigerians, Africans in the diaspora, you know, they really want to see this kind of you know, content. They want to know about our history. They want to see our history in film. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I mean um, when I use that use that term. Mm. I appreciate that also, like broadening this scope beyond just film, which is mostly what we discussed during this conversation, and also sure. the, it's art broadly defined. You know, even visual art and, yeah. and so on and so forth. And maybe I should mention this for the audience that we are going to have a longer conversation about about your collective with the festival's curator Nyambura Waringe. So that's a conversation to look forward to. And lastly, what should the people expect from you? You know, you're you have a number of shots out in the world. You have a feature film that people who have watched as part of NDF. You have all this other work you've put out in the world. What should we expect from you next? Okay, um, I've I've done another short recently um, called Rehearsal. Um, so I expect it will be doing festival runs. I've just recently completed it, so it'll be festivals for 2021. Um, as a collective, we've also done a a an anthology feature film called Juju Stories, which is based on like uh, Nigerian folk tales um, that have like supernatural themes to them. So they're like it's like a three part feature film um, directed by each of the collective. Um, so that will again launch in is only recently been finished. We're still doing tweaking post production, but that will be out again in um, 2021. Um, and uh, yeah, beyond that, I'm, I'm, I'm writing, working on one or two other things. There'll be more shorts coming and hopefully um, uh, start developing a, a feature and hopefully scale that feature up more so than tattoos. I mean, like have a bigger budget, hopefully. Yeah. Fantastic. This is also exciting. I mean, just judging off of what I've watched. I'm really looking forward to whatever you come up with next. And yeah, also looking forward to 2021 because evidently you have a lot cooking and that's exciting to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to okay. be treated yeah. to all of that. Yeah. Thank you so much for making time to talk to us. I look forward to our conversation about the collective with Nyambura later this week and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you, Nyambura. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you.